Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are and whenever you are. Welcome to another episode of Community Live Stream. My name is Chuck Tomasi. I am the ServiceNow guy with the cool bow tie. Notice, I'm going to put that away for just a second. Notice I have a new bow tie. This is thanks to the wonderful people over at H4H, my good friends in Paris, France, who gave this to me last week while I was on a family vacation. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be wearing it too much on the, the live stream because it does tend to interfere a little bit with the green screen behind me, but there's always live coding happy hour and tech now and many other places where I can wear this. Uh, but I greatly appreciate it. I want to thank them very much for the generous gift, spending time with me as, as we do that. I need to go and look at, I have an issue here with the video feed there we are just making sure everything is up and running if you are joining us live thank you very much let me make myself smaller so that i can tell you how to do this we broadcast this on youtube if you like that subscribe to the channel put a like on this video if you find something helpful in there and uh, that will help other people as we go along so youtube slash service now community that's where you can find that information. We also do this on Twitch at the exact same time. <laughs> if anybody's watching over there, I don't see anybody at the moment, but if you happen to watch this now or later, we do this at Twitch TV slash now community. And if you do have a question or comment, looks like some of our regulars are jumping in. Kevin Eldridge, good morning, Kevin, and James Hammond, good morning to you. This is morning in the US, but as I discovered last week, it's late afternoon in Rome. Yeah, it really kind of blows your mind when you get back and go, wait, what, what, wait, no, it, it's no wonder I'm waking up at one in the morning right now. It's because my brain, it, it's funny, I, I, I had an easier time. Most people will say going east is harder, but I uh, got adjusted to the time zone. We went to London for three days, Paris for three days, and Rome for three days. And I adjusted to London in nothing flat. I mean, it was, it was pretty easy. Then coming back, I am on what day two of trying to wake up on Arizona time. It's crazy. I, it's, I, it, it's backwards from what I usually do. This has been an abnormal trip in terms of jet lag. All right, we are cruising along. If you've got a question, put it in the community at community.servicenow.com so that others can partake and enjoy and learn from your experience or your questions. If you've got just a weather forecast or uh, want to say hello from wherever you are in the world, put that in Twitch or YouTube and I will look forward to seeing it there. So community is going to get you more eyeballs. If you do use the community, make sure you use the right topic and the right uh, uh, forum in there. So if you've got a developer related question, put it in the developer community. If you've, got, if you've got a developer question on service portal, there is a topic for service portal and that will help people find it. If you've got something related to ITOM or reporting, there are separate forms for that as well. So I encourage you to do that. And please only post once. If you start posting it, especially posting it in multiple places, it can get very confusing for people trying to answer it. And then later when people are trying to find the right answer or something similar, they're gonna go, wait, I've got two threads with the same subject, which one is in, it, it's, it's just a big mess. So please only post once. We've got a whole list of proper community etiquette, but I won't go through it here today. Uh, good morning, Carolyn. Good to see you. And I would also like to remind you, if you haven't done so already, go to developer.servicenow.com where you can find a whole bunch of great information, including a free personal developer instance running any of the latest releases. I encourage you to do that. You can use it as a sandbox. You can test things out. You can uh, try some of the products that would normally cost money. Do a POV, show your company how valuable they are. Learn, there's all kinds of learning paths over there. Let me, in my imagination, do we have a bit of a latency issue? Oh, it's a couple seconds, not too bad. Still playing around some of the hardware and software. The machines have been quiet for over 10 days, so anything could happen today. We'll see what happens there. Also look under the events. We have developer meetups all over the world. There are about 40 chapters right now, it's crazy. Uh, I do know that Chicago and New York haven't had a meetup in a while, and the meetup organizers have stepped back. So we are looking for uh, someone to step up. It's not a big deal to, uh, to do this. Might be good for your personal brand, might be good for education, networking purposes to get people together uh, once a month, quarterly, whatever you decide. 
and talk developer stuff, solve problems, discuss new features, whatever happens to be. If you need some information about that, let me know. I'll be happy to point you in the right direction. So that's all about the developer community. I believe that did it. We did community, developer, YouTube, Twitch. I, I asked a few weeks ago if anybody was interested in news stories. And this one uh, hit the street yesterday, I believe it was, that Forbes, you know, Forbes magazine, uh, that very famous money magazine, has done a ranking of the most innovative companies in the world. And look who is at the top of the list. I'm going to blow that up just a little bit so we can see it. Yes, it's our very own ServiceNow at the top. Now, there is, it is based on what they call an innovation premium. So it is a value system. There's another article that says how they rank this. It's not just a popularity contest. It, it has to do with a, a number of factors that I won't get into here today. If you're interested, I can show you that article. I'll have to dig it up from from one of the threads that we've got on an internal feed. But uh, look at the names that are on here, though. ServiceNow, Workday, Salesforce, Tesla, Amazon, Netflix. Those are some pretty big hitters. And, and we're ranked above all of those in terms of innovation. So that's pretty cool. You get down here, number 10, Facebook, uh, Adobe, number 13, Autodesk, number 15. That's it just... I'd never heard of this list before until yesterday, and then all of a sudden, boom, this comes out and just goes to show what a uh, <laughs> what a wonderful ride it's been and where we are going in the future with innovation and whatnot. So I wanted to share that story with you. If you're looking for that, somebody did post this on the community. It was right here. They've got a link, Forbes.com slash innovative dash companies slash list. Uh, kind of a crazy URL, but if you if you look on Forbes for that, you can find it as well. I think it's also been socialized a lot of times. I posted it uh, yesterday morning, I believe it was, onto LinkedIn and Twitter. So if you're following me there, at C Tomasi, you're going to put that up real quick, at C Tomasi on Twitter or connect with me on LinkedIn, you'll get those stories and more. So that's that's what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, Let's see, we got the bow tie, we got the Forbes story, a little bit about the European vacation. I say we get going. Let's get this train started and dig into the community because that's what I'm here to do is show you not only answers, but how I got to those answers or discover something new. Or I've got one for you that I'll, I'll share a little bit later. Is like, how did I not know that? It's, it's crazy. This came up before I even left. I wanted to make a note of it so that I didn't forget when we came back. Apologize for not be doing, be not being able to do a show yesterday. I did need to take care of a few things uh, that weren't complete by showtime. This is done at 6 a.m. Arizona time, 1 p.m. UTC. You do, you do the math for wherever you are and, and we'll get working on that. So a couple of things that I, I spotted here before I started the show. One was, da -da -da -da, where'd it go? What is a reference qualifier in service now? These may seem basic to some of you that have some experience in there. They posted three questions, which I don't recommend doing necessarily in the community because how do you market correct if there's multiple topics in there? Now, these are fairly simple answers and they could have found them with a lot of, uh, a lot of them are documented. In fact, the replies that we got say, links, links, and more links, RTFM, read the fabulous manual. Uh, the, what is a reference call on fire and service now? Again, we have a link to that, a link to that, a link to that. Ulrich jumped right on that. Congratulations to him. There was another one with the same three links. Uh, in, in short, I'm going to go through each one of these real quickly, just so for completeness, I am going to, I am using my developer instance. Where'd it go? There it is. Developer instance is over here. And when I look at a reference field. A reference field is simply a pointer. It holds a, a GUID or what we call a SysID in ServiceNow to an, a record in another table. Classic example is our incident table where we have this caller field. And you'll see some special icons next to these. Caller, if I right click on that and say show caller, it gives me information about that field and it says 
it is of type reference and the reference points to the sys underscore user table and if I say configure dictionary on that I can drill into the dictionary entry for that field remember there are people that are watching for the first time on here and you never know if like the thing I'm going to show you a little bit later you may have missed something in the last 10 years that you didn't notice there's a lot of information about this field there again is the type for this the label is caller but the field name at the database level is caller underscore id this is so we can do multiple languages and put different labels on depending on what language you're looking at then we go a little further and under reference specification we've got this thing called reference qualifier it's a filter if i didn't have any filter on here which i don't it's going to show all users in that table which may not be appropriate who is the caller on this incident well over time you're going to get employees possibly customers vendors all kinds of users in there maybe we've switched vendors or the employee has left the organization and the active field is now unchecked i can excuse me Ooh, that t isn't going down so well the <laughs> the the filter can be applied to say i only want records where active is true if i hit apply on that then all the ex employees who have left the company are no longer displayed it's a way of making your data more foolproof this is only for this field if i have multiple fields that are pointing to the same table i would need to set reference qualifiers on each of those independently which is a plus and a minus if you think about it if you want to make a global filter then you can do what's called a before query business rule that filters anything that is going after that table and say look i don't care who you are or where you're coming from what reference field it is if you're pointing at sys user we're going to filter out the inactive people or we're going to filter out the customers or whatever it happens to be so that people choosing that value in the field can't do it improperly so that's what it's for you can do a simple filter like this and using the condition builder make it as complex as you like maybe for this one you say location is chicago we can pick that right off of the good old reference picker say chicago and that would filter the list to only active users in chicago that's a simple reference qualifier you could also use what's called a dynamic reference qualifier and those are predefined filters that you could say hey what filters have been defined on this table that are dynamic the classic example is um, if it's assigned to me where, where me represents the person on the browser rather than putting in some javascript code on every reference qualifier i can define a dynamic filter there aren't any in this point in this use case bad demo in my case but you can define them under dynamic filter options under system definition dynamic filter options and define your own dynamic filters so that they show up in this list for the proper table and then uh, it, it makes it not so static like active is true that's a static query it, it's querying the table and saying give me just the data where that field equals that value this lets you build in some more dynamic uh, data driven possibly even date and time driven values uh, maybe somebody's on vacation you want to say filter these users where they're not on vacation in this period whatever the case may be and then finally there's an advanced reference qualifier where you can put in an expression uh, javascript my user query and pass it arguments whatever where my user query would be a function defined in a script include you could call different methods in if your script include happen to be classed and it will return what's called an encoded query string that's the filter that it's going to apply to the records that are in that table best practice is if you don't need the data don't get all the data so here's another way to filter it down and speed up performance maybe you only need uh, people in a specific group that would be another case for a dynamic uh, reference qualifier but this one gives you ultimate power but also has ultimate 
maintenance as well, because you're going to have to write that script, my user query, define what it is, debug it, make sure it returns the right encoded query. You can use multiple parameters, other data that's on the form, that sort of thing. So that's a reference qualifier in short form. What is Glide System? Glide System comes right out of the product documentation. Actually, I'm going to go to the developer portal because that's where it's defined the APIs. Glide System is a series of functions or methods, if you will, that are that let you get hooks into the system, that let you uh, do things like display messages or get the time of day. Lots of different glide system, add error message, put a message at the top of the screen. Probably familiar with a lot of these. I have used many of them, but not all of them. For example, I don't use base64 encode and decode that often. I think I did when I was uh, doing some authentication with a, uh, with a REST API. There are lots and lots of date time functions beginning of last week, beginning of next week. A lot of these correspond to the drop downs that you see when you're picking a date, for example. Uh, there is end of last week. And event queue is one that I frequently use for putting an event into the event queue and letting the event engine process it to possibly trigger a notification or run another script. Uh, many of these I've never seen before. Get CSS cache version string. Okay, uh, it might be interesting to find out more about that. Get current scope name, get session token, get URL on stack. Might be fun to play with some of these in, in the scripts background and find out what they do. Has role, if you say gs.hasrole and, and give it a role name, you say, does this person have admin role? If it does, it returns a Boolean. Hours ago, a lot of them around time and date. There's also gs.set redirect, which is very similar. You may have seen this in a UI action action.setRedirectURL. This lets you do this from anywhere in any script. So if you wanted to run a business rule, for example, and redirect them back to a page or a record producer and redirect them to a specific place there. Actually, there's a different way to do that one, but I won't get into that. Um, XML to JSON, very interesting. There's, there's also, as I mentioned, add error message, add info message. If you wanted to put messages at, on your screen, Glide system has a lot of APIs. Generally, it's the system level stuff. When you start getting into the database, that's when you start interacting with Glide Record. So, good morning, Balaji. Hope you are having a wonderful day, wherever you are. And then finally, what is CMDB? CMDB is your database of stuff. That's, that's what we are managing. Configuration management database. Very common if you are familiar with the uh, ITIL practices, the the CMDB is is I I, I say it's analogous to uh, an employee org chart for HR. Okay, if IT doesn't have a valid up to date CMDB, how do you know what you're managing? How do you know what your costs are? How do you know what somebody owns and where it needs required maintenance and scheduled? There's there's a lot of information you can draw out of a CMDB and many different ways you can populate it, among which are ServiceNow Discovery, service mapping, you could import spreadsheets, you can integrate with third-party systems. But to have a, a core uh, uh, database of assets, it's hierarchically based, so it's very well organized. We use our own table extension in there. In fact, the table extension, the CMDB is, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, it's the most extensive table extension in the entire system starting with the base table and extending to hardware and software and hardware goes to computers and servers and network equipment. Lots of information in there in a very well organized fashion. How you decide to implement it and organize it is up to you. We do have information on implementing an effective CMDB on the customer success center. I'm gonna show that to you. If you haven't seen this, it was announced at Knowledge and I don't think I've done any shows since Knowledge, so we can go ahead and show this going to servicenow.com, new page layout, and under customers is customer success center. And that will take me to best practices and all kinds of other good information that you can see in here. It is an evolving, constantly living website. So I encourage you to come back here, whether you are in a plan phase, a deploy phase, optimize or extend, whatever phase of your journey you're in, even if you're, you're 
in in a later phase in one aspect like ITSM, you may still be in a planning phase for ITBM. So check it out, look around, get familiar with what's on the customer success center and uh, get to know that could be very helpful for you. So that answers those three questions. I am not going to put in the same links as well, but wanted to make sure that anybody watching this video doesn't miss that uh, information that's in there. All right, back to the homepage. Hopefully that was helpful. If so, don't forget to click that like button. Appreciate it very much. Adding filters in impersonated query doesn't work. I mean, there was something else down here that I wanted to show you. Don't remember what it was. I saw it just before we started. Mandatory fields. No, that wasn't it. Oh. May have been a little further down. That's the one we just answered. What is a reference qualifier? So things have been coming in. Uh, what is an inbound email action? Okay, it's probably the simplest type of integration, and I, I I've often call it the low. Is this the same person asking three questions in one? <laughs> An inbound email action is the processing that goes on when the system receives an email. So when I email instance name at servicenow.com, it gets routed to my instance, and through a series of rules, these inbound actions, it says, what would you like me to do with this? I could create a record, I could update a record, I could, uh, depending on what the context is of this, is it a reply, is it a new message, what does it say, how is it formatted, what the content, I can parse that all out and make sense of it. It's, it's sometimes labor intensive, depending on what you've got in your message. Attachments to the inbound mail will be attachments on the resulting record or attached to the existing record if it's an update. And uh, it, it, it's, again, a, a very easy way, uh, well, I wouldn't say <laughs> easy, it may not be the easiest way to import data, but it is a way to import it if you have no other means. If, if you, you're talking to a third-party system uh, and it's able to send you email, you can process them this way. Uh, what are the methods available in Glide Aggregate? Very, Glide Aggregate is, if you haven't uh, been aware of it, again, I'm going to go to the where are we? Glide aggregate is a method, excuse me, a class for programming that allows you to do manipula uh, not manipulations, operations of records at the database layer. And what I mean by that is the most common one is counting records. If you are just counting how many active incidents do I have, you could do that with Glide record and use a function called get row count but it's going to retrieve all of those records. And if you've been doing this for five or 10 years and you've got 2 million incidents, it's going to have to retrieve all of those and it can be quite slow. If you do this in a business rule, you could keep the user waiting for two, three, five, ten 10 seconds while you're counting records. Glide Aggregate, on the other hand, uses built-in database, um, what's the word I'm looking for? <sighs> Primitives, if you will to say, hey, database, count the rows that match this query, active equals true, from the incident table. And it will return it very, very quickly, like in the, in the milliseconds of time, rather than in seconds of time. So you can do things like counting, average, min, max. Uh, you can start, you can group these together and say, group them by category, so that not only am I counting incidents, but I'm counting how many hardware incidents and how many inquiry incidents and how many software incidents, network and database, whatever your categories happen to be set up, you can do it that way. Uh, Glad aggregate is very powerful, very fast. If you're just doing a count, min, max, average, that sort of operation, use those. A uh, quick question for Balaji. A quick question, Mr. Chuck, in Portfolio Workbench, how resource allocation is calculated in, in resource allocation widget? I apologize. I don't know a whole lot about the portfolio workbench. I'm not an ITBM person. My specialty lies in the platform, custom applications, and integrations mostly. So those are the types of issues that I will focus on. I encourage you to post that in the community. Make sure you get that into the ITBM forum and tag it with the project or portfolio topic. That the, that way you get the right people looking at it and hopefully someone with that expertise 
can give you an answer. But in this particular case, I am unable to provide you any information because I just haven't been exposed to that. It's, it's funny. I was just having this discussion with a coworker yesterday that not too many years ago, it, it almost was possible to know a good depth of information in ServiceNow because it was largely ITSM based until about 2010, maybe 2009. A lot of it was ITSM. Even if you got into discovery and runbook, which later became orchestration, uh, it, that was pretty much it. It was the ITSM tools, orchestration, and discovery. And discovery and, and orchestration were a, a bit of a, an extended knowledge, but still capable of, of learning it. And then we started uh, creating more vertical applications in HR and facilities and security and GRC. And it's, it's very difficult and now we have specialists in those areas. And, and again, mine is in the platform in general uh, for building custom applications and integrations, helping people understand what the platform is capable of and, and finding those solutions. So again, that's quick sidebar on that. There was another question on here. What is a script include with one best example? Script includes are a library of server side code that you can call from any server side script, workflows, uh, business rules, UI actions, uh, pretty much anything but client scripts and, and UI policies and UI scripts. Those are the three main client side ones. I am going to, I don't remember where this is, my techno episode list, but I believe it's episode six. See if my memory is still working right. Episode six was on script includes. Yes, it was. So I will send that link to them just as an FYI. Lots of good discussion in here. Inbound action, an example of script include. Oh, and video link. What did they link to? Did they link to my video or did they link to something else? Uh, yep, yeah, episode six. So I'm not going to repeat that link. They've already put it in there. That's script includes. So thank you very much. Helps to read the messages before you go and make a reply. Let's take a look and see if there's anything new in here. I'm going to do a quick page refresh that we can get some new material, get a discussion going. Please brief explanation about orchestration and discovery. Yes, orchestration allows you to automate integrations with third-party applications. Key examples that we usually use are around virtual machines for your cloud management and accounts, say Active Directory. I can have, as part of my onboarding process, orchestration, do the integration to Active Directory to create the account. The manager, let's say the manager comes in, here's, here's the use case, manager comes in, says I've got a new hire starting on the 14th, they put in via a catalog item or record producer, really doesn't matter how they get it to me, something that is going to kick off a workflow, which will order them a laptop and tell IT all what they need to do. But we can also automate a lot of that stuff when it comes to creating the account. When I was young and didn't have orchestration, we created these by hand. I was making multiple accounts, one for a Unix system, one for uh, Active Directory, one for there were multiple places and that's subject to human error and also takes a lot longer. It would probably, it took, if I remember right, even I had a lot of these things scripted, it still took about 30 minutes to complete this process. Why not turn it over to the machine? You've already got the information. You already know what the credentials are. You already know what the groups are, the roles, all that stuff and fire it off in a workflow. Saves time, reduces errors. That's value. So that's, that's what orchestration can do. Same kind of thing for VMware. If you wanted to spin up virtual machines or manage them or spin them down or whatever, we use orchestration in our training, in our knowledge conference, in our forums. It's, it's very easy for, uh, we've got an instance where we, we have people schedule, when is the class? The class is Tuesday through Thursday. Okay, I need, I need instances with this image spun up at this time, and it goes off to AWS for Amazon or Azure for Microsoft, one of these cloud services that can rent us this space, and we spin up those machines, 
when we did knowledge a couple of weeks ago in Las Vegas, over the course of the, the few days of the conference, we spun up and spun down about 50,000 virtual machines because every attendee has the expectation of going to a workshop, sitting down, they get their own personal instance for that hour, two hours, whatever it happens to be, to do their exercise. It's going to be configured the way they need it to do that exercise, whether it's on workflow or service portal or security incident management. That That's all done in the background through the configuration process. But when the image is brought up, it's ready to go for them. And that's all automated. That would be infathomable, incalculable, and horrifically expensive if we didn't use orchestration, if uh, if there was something else. Discovery, on the other hand, is a different product. That allows you to go and discover the hardware and software devices and packages that you've got in your organization and create a relational database between them. So not only do I know that Chuck has this particular laptop and it's loaded with this software, if I happen to be communicating, maybe maybe not my laptop, but uh, I found a uh, uh, an Apache web server and the Apache web server is using port 1521 to talk to an Oracle database, I can use that port communication, the TCP information to relate those two together to say, hey, this Apache web server depends on this database server. Therefore, when I get that all into my CMDB, I can do things like risk management. I need to patch this database server. What is it going to impact? Who are the upstream CIs or configuration items in the database that are, are going to be affected? And who needs to approve that? And what is the cost? And do I have any maintenance windows that I need to adhere to? All of that can be brought forth through discovery. Uh, yes, I could do spreadsheets and whatnot, but spreadsheets are notoriously out of date to import all that information on a regular basis. Uh, it would be obsolete the minute you imported it because things are constantly switching around and configurations are changing and software is being loaded and unloaded and we're not going to get into all that. But discovery, you can you can tell it, hey, once a night or uh, go go scan this IP range and once a week, go scan this other IP range on your uh it, it, it will pick up devices such as IP phones. Uh, it will pick up devices, any, really anything that's IP addressable is what Discovery can find. Uh, there is a similar product called Service Mapping that doesn't do a broad horizontal scan of an IP range, but starts at an entry point for a specific business service and then finds intelligently finds the other CIs that are related to that. Wow, we are cranking through a lot of questions in here. Thank you very much. Great discussion today. I'm not hardly doing anything on the community. Uh, WLF test, any suggestions on changing incident request categories and subcategories for the mature organization, i.e. what to do with the old incidents and requests? I wouldn't do anything with them. It is, this is simply a matter of managing your choices. And if you look at, I'm going to go back to the incident, for example. And I have category and subcategory in here. And if I want to, say, deprecate hardware, I don't necessarily want to delete it, but I can make it inactive. In fact, if you look at the choices on here and say show choice list for category, you will notice behind the scenes that it says inactive false. This is, I think, the only table that does this reverse logic. Everything else has an active field, and it will say active true. This is inactive false to make it active. Don't ask, it was before my time. It's one of the things I noticed as a customer and confused the explicative out of me. <laughs> Let me go back to this because you, that's not the, the happiest, healthiest way to manage this. But if I go to say category, configure choices, I simply want say, you know what? I don't use this inquiry help anymore. Let's put it over there. It's still a valid value in the database. Uh, if, it's, if it's going to show up on a report, it's going to show up in, in like blue. It's going to say, hey, this is, this is a value on this record, but it's not available to choose from. So you can still use that. Save those choices. You won't, be able, you won't see this in the dropdown anymore. 
Uh, if you want to add additional ones, you put them down here, add a new item. And of course, if it, you want to set up the dependent subcategory choice list the same way. So hopefully that helps that, that I, I had to do this in the, the two or so years that I was a customer. Things change. You're going to find different categories and whatnot. Make sure that people understand what those categories are for and you're not just adding categories for the sake of category, categorization. Uh, the best practice is don't expose your end users to those things because they won't pick the right ones anyway. <laughs> or you make the, the, uh, the, the question so simple they can't choose the wrong one. Is this a hardware issue or a software issue? Of course, someone's going to say other. <laughs> That's, uh, make it as easy on them as you can. If you have to, you could uh, a use case. This might be a use case for uh, machine learning for agent intelligence to do that auto selection of categorization, prioritization, assignment based on the uh, text in the description. So that it, that would reduce your triage to these things. Uh, you could also automatically set them up with rules if you wish or do the assignment based on those rules but i i remember when i was a customer prior to service now uh, that they had four choices it was something like category subcategory product name and there was a fourth one i don't even remember what it was but nobody ever picked the right things i got i could get category i could get subcategory but product name or product item or product class, whatever it was, never seemed to have the right answer. And that fourth one never seemed to make sense either. So if you're just gathering, don't expose your users, your, your end users to that. Remember, there's more of them than there are of you. If it's an inconvenience on them, it's amplified. If it's an inconvenience on you, it's, it, it's an inconvenience at that point. Oh, sorry, itchy nose. So that's, that's what I got to say about categories and subcategories, just kind of throwing that out there as FYI. Um, Harish says, SSL certificates have expiration dates. Are they CIs that we should track or is this something that should be handled by the software license management? Any suggestions? I have to plead ignorance on this one, Harish. I don't know uh, too much about how the CIs are handled and SSL certificates. Uh, that would be something you probably want to check with asset management or possibly software asset management. I, again, I'm not, a, I'm not a SAM expert. Uh, question for the community at that case. Uh, for everyone that has posted a question here, can you ask your question to the community yet? Good question, Kevin. Thank you very much. I was just about to say that. That is uh, exactly what the community is for. Uh, I've got no problem answering some quick questions if it can be answered. Mm. Okay. Fun little tip that I found that you might enjoy. It came up I think it was in the uh, the last video I did. I think it was Thursday, maybe Friday before I left. What would that have been, the 17th or 18th? And somebody had asked, is there a way to add multiple people at a time to a list field? A list field looks like this. We don't have multiple selects because that would be horrifically long if you said, hey, give me a multi-select of the user table. So we do it like a reference field. Reference fields store a sysid. List fields store a comma-separated comma separated list of sysids to the records in the table they reference. Common example is the watch list field on the incident table. And if I say show watch list, like I did before with caller ID, it says, this is the watch list field. It exists on the task table. Therefore, it's available to the incident table and any other table that extends task. It is of type glide list. It points to the sys user table. It is a very long field, so it can hold lots and lots of sys IDs. And it has some attributes on it as well. Well, normally we would go like this and say, I want David Lou or Dave Slusher in this case. I would like to add Craig Step." And you pick the names one by one, but that's kind of time consuming. You could also pull up the magnifying glass and start adding people like Alejandro Mascal. Yeah, that's one at a time. In this case, you can even add email lists if you want to talk to somebody externally. What I didn't know or never noticed until somebody pointed it out about an hour after we had finished the video is this icon over to the right that says add remove multiple. Some people may be laughing and go, Chuck, how did you not see that before? 
Maybe I can blame it on getting old and losing my memory and having too much information in my head, but this allows you to bring up a slush bucket and it brings over the three that were already in there plus anyone else who is in the list. Reference qualifiers apply here. Remember reference qualifiers from before? If I said active equals true, it's going to say active equals true. If it doesn't, I can always add it myself and say, run this filter and see if active is true is here. I'm not sure what that little hover over is for incident. That's cute. Oh, this window probably applies to the incident that I'm on. So now I can add and remove. We'll take Bo multiple people at a time, save that, and bada boom, bada bing, this list gets filled with all those wonderful people that I picked. Never noticed that before. Easy enough. So again, if you think this is helpful, click the like button. If you want to see more of this, subscribe and get notified on YouTube when the uh, stream goes live. It's crazy how some of these things have been in there for, makes me wonder how long has that been in there? Hmm. I could go back to a few releases and check, but I suspect it's been there for quite a while. I'm going to look. I can go back as far as Calgary on, uh, on instances that I have readily available. I'm, I'm going to look and see if I can get an answer for that one. There's your hot tip of the day. You never know what you're going to get out of this show. It might be random stuff out of the community. It might be sneaky little tips that I found. So thank you for joining me. If you are just joining, my name is Chuck Tomasi, going through the ServiceNow community and answering questions and explaining how I get these answers. I'm going to look for anything that's unreplied now and see if there's anything we can dig into. Uh, my dev instance is unavailable. Good use case for that. That one goes into the instance help. Let's see if it's alive and not available or just offline and needs to be woken up. We'll see. Four, five, seven, four, five. Dev 45745.servicenow.com. Again, there's a personal developer instance they got over at developer.servicenow.com. And I am unable to see that awake, so I'm going to leave that for specialists. Sometimes if it's alive and online, I can help out and do something there, but I don't have the ability to look behind the scenes and kick it in the head. If I see a lot of those, then it usually points to a systemic issue, like maybe we're doing patches and systems aren't waking up as quickly as they should. Looking for a new opportunity in DFW? Anybody want a, a job in Dallas-Fort Worth? Looking for a local client, looking for a ServiceNow principal architect. Actually, you know what? I am going to hang on to that because I just got a message from somebody on LinkedIn that was looking for a job, but I don't recall where they're located. So DFW opportunity pardon me while i make a couple of quick notes for myself for later thank you for the might be the one that already format forwarded them i don't know uh in service portal page design there's a page which has a form where an employee details are asked like name count country manager not sure i understand what the question is here let's see if we can dig in I'm not that strong at Service Portal. I can only answer just a few of the questions if it's something that I've run into before. A lot of them are around coding. Uh, input, user ID, manager, server-side scripting. Okay. There is a page which has a form where an employee details asks for name, country, manager, where manager field is dependent on name field and will auto-populate based on the logged in username field in the widget editor. I've written the HTML and server side script, the logged in username automatically populates, but not the manager name. Okay, let's look at, so the populating data sys user ID is gs.getUserID. There's Glide system coming at us again. If we didn't get it, you, you have major problems if you didn't. Um, then they use get ID sys user get data sys user id if data user exists i don't think we really this this part didn't feel necessary to me where are they expecting to put in the oh name is going to be get value manager so value is 
It should be getting a sys ID because they're using data name one. Did they bind this together? I often find that there's an issue when I when I just randomly declare things to make sure you do a, a an ng bind. Take a look at ng bind to ensure your data model maps to oops maps to the HTML inputs. You might also want to consider using ng to ng input. I can never remember. Angular JS API input. Uh, ng input npm. No, I don't want them to load npm stuff. I think you just need to do the ng bind. Looking at w3 schools real quick. Bigger, 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 bigger. That's good. ng model. That's it. Not ng bind. In fact, I will give a link to that. Do, 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 do. Reference from W3 schools. Oh. Come on. And as we discovered a couple of weeks ago, Command K on a Mac brings up this window. Time saver, which is nice because that's also the key on many other applications to insert a link. That one makes me happy. All right, error message on profile types in the GRC. Not a GRC person. Need to create SR based on scheduled job. Be able to take a look at that one real quick. Schedule jobs are fine if you want to just create records. I have a requirement like I need to create SR automatically using schedule job based on the date field on the form. For this, I've created one staging table where it will store all of all of the data of our ITM, including variable values. Schedule job will run and insert a new SR if there are any SRs. So they have condition, en encoded query. Item is this. Oops. Item is this. I tried to highlight the text and it grabbed the image. Apologies. Date value equals JavaScript colon GS now. Hope the thing is right. Um, use staging table for schedule. What table are they getting this out of? Cart, card ID, add item. I would consider using a workflow with a timer activity on this if they could. New date dot value. This this is this is a bit messed up. I don't know if I would approach it that way. I recommend a different approach. How about a workflow on the table triggers task? In order to get that equality, holy crap, you'd have to hit it right on the nose. The timer activity on the workflow is very good. And it's sitting around and waiting for a specific time. Your scheduled job, on the other hand, has to run exactly big capital letters when the time hits. You can either use less than or equals to determine if the time has passed or use a workflow and timer activity to construct the records you need. Question, does this have to be a catalog item? 
using the cart API. Or it would help if we knew what the underlying business requirement was. Requirement is, come on. Another suggestion, take a look at, oh, where is it? Helps if I remember my macros right. Take a look at the scriptless schedule jobs thing that I wrote before. If you're using Kingston, you might even be able to get away with Flow Designer because I believe that supports the catalog now, which is always nice. Orchestration AD activity, Forbes innovated list. What soft phones? Is there a glide date time variant for get by format? What the question is there? What are you trying to do? I have a glide date time and want to print it with the given format. I notice that there is a get by format function for glide date and glide time, but not for glide date time. Did I just not find it? Was it here a specific reason for not implementing it or do I have to have an alternative for this? Edit, this is what I use now and it was created in just a few minutes. So I'm curious why ServiceNow doesn't provide this out of the box. What am I missing? So format is this split on a space. Get by format, format time, get by format output is glide date plus glide time. Very good question. I don't have an answer, but I would like to keep abreast of this. So I subscribe and there we go. Should do a show to see where we came from and where we are now, Calgary to Kingston. Kevin, I, I had Calgary up on the screen a, a couple months ago, and somebody said, Calgary hurts my eyes. <laughs> but yeah, that would be fun. Calgary, interestingly enough, was the first step, the first release where we started coming out with this idea of applications. It, it wasn't quite scoping yet. That didn't come along until Fuji when we enforced the scopes and had APIs and all that good stuff. And that was a little rough at first. Uh, has gotten a lot better. Calgary actually had the concept of building an application. It was still global, but it was, it was where you could begin to coordinate the, the artifacts around that application. Uh, I recall doing the loaner request application in Calgary back around 2013. And, and that was a huge step forward from doing things independently and having shortcuts on the sidebar. It was, it was quite frustrating. I'd like to even go back even further than that and show you like some of the older releases from 2009, 2010. That would give you a really good indication of where we've come from. Uh, I'll see if I can find one of those. I, I may still have access to that. I'll tell you, they, they, um, it, it was kind of like old computers. They started up a lot faster, too. But obviously, the code base was probably a tenth of what we have today when you think of all the other products that are in there. All right, real quick, let's refresh this unreplied section, see if anything can come in the last few minutes. We are coming down to the end of the show. I do this for about an hour every weekday or every weekday that I'm available, and the technology wants to cooperate. <laughs> do this from sunny Phoenix, Arizona. When I can, and I look forward to doing this again tomorrow with you. So again, before we take off and say good day for the day or good night, as it were, in your case, you're part of the world, uh, again, click the, the thumbs up if you found something in this helpful or at least uh, an inspirational to some degree. If you subscribe to this, you'll get notified in the future. So available on uh, Twitch and YouTube. I do see somebody watching over there on Twitch. Thank you very much for watching that. Uh, does anyone know how the data gets inserted into service offering commitment table? That's in IT service management. I don't think I have that table available on my personal developer instance. Service, it's probably a plugin that I need to turn on, but let's take a look. Offering, what was it? Service offering commitment? Clink commitment dot list. 
that was something there there right there is a hint at something that changed uh ui 16 i think it was maybe maybe it was an actual release where you had to type for example if i did incident.list in older releases as soon as i hit that letter t it would go great let's go and then we put in this thing that where you had to hit enter and a lot of people got bummed out about that at first <laughs> let me tell you if you're trying to write lab guides and you want a screen capture of that it's really nice that it doesn't take off on you i had to do a lot of doctoring to try and get that i had to try and get a screenshot say type this in this box now you just type it sit there go do my screen capture so i know they didn't they didn't do it just for me uh, i also believe it was for accessibility reasons a lot of the ui changes that we make are for accessibility reasons there's there's a lot of visually impaired people that need to be able to tab around the interface and use the keyboard because a mouse just isn't going to work for them okay service portal widget help i can take a look can't promise an answer on that one but it's always fun maybe learn something in the process of doing that as well hi all i am having a table like below they have a body they have a row they have two cells within that row one says testing one says input hey look ng model i'm using a table with a record producer and trying to set the value of the input field weighting measuring impact variable um uh, g form set value g f wow is chief g form even available on that interesting you're not going to get g form in there that one is splunk add-on for service now does not fetch all query data new service now site customer success center is this an announcement is this a question let's see what this is check out the new customer success center <laughs> all right created 20 days ago but yet updated 15 minutes ago interesting hr case history is in hr service delivery my dev instance i already looked at that one looking for a new opportunity i think we've gone through pretty much all of these i don't have anything to pull out of the old legacy stuff we are at this back at it good morning steve good to see you catch the last bit of this you can always catch the the whole thing will be posted and rendered in about an hour so i'll have that done as soon as we could thank you for joining me i think this is one of the uh bigger crowds we've had on community live stream and i'm happy to do it it's easy to have a lot more energy when i'm still jet lagged from europe waking up at about 1 a.m trying to sleep until 3 a.m and then say the heck with it i'm getting up i'll be nice and prepared and again thank you for joining me and i look forward to seeing you again tomorrow for some more random obscure information about service now that hopefully you find helpful and if you do find it helpful and you learn something be sure to share it and you will be helpful as well so until then let me give you the uh be sure to find us over at youtube and twitch go onto the community and i will see you tomorrow take care bye